Welcome back. This is the Catholic Lady, and we're reading Great Line of God by Taylor Caldwell. We're in chapter 25, and this is part three. After a moment's brooding thought, a bro after a moment's brooding thought, he continued, but it was as if he spoke to himself in dull amazement and wonder and chilling fear. We heard the jackals howling in the wilderness. We saw the moon glow more luminous against the black sky. The night began to slope to dawn. We awaited it as men await deliverance. For now, my men were showing increasing uneasiness. The tomb glowed in white light. It appeared to me to shimmer, to wax and wane. Once I thought I heard the sound of gigantic wings. The men built their fires higher and raised their voices against the silence. For now there was no sound, not even from the city. They stuffed bread and meat in their mouths to warn off fright and played games more feverishly. Some cursed the Jews for this stupid vigil and the temple guards glowered. Some imbued with the religion of the Egyptians spoke of Osiris rising from the dead and still others coarsely laughed at them. Many rose and began to wander, scanning the opaque countryside and desert frowning. We all looked at the sky for the dawn. For the anxious and uneasy men, it appeared the dawn would never come. But at last there was a hazy rose-colored flush over the eastern mounts, the hem of Aurora's robe trailing and blowing silently into the dark sky. And before that hem, the nearer stars began to flee. Then the top of the mounts were rimmed with sudden bright gold, a brilliant tracing against the rose. The soldiers and the guards looked at it happily. Within the hour they would be at home and free. The moon, a mere wan skull, declined and fell behind a mountain and was lost. Titus Milo re relieved himself yet strangely depressed, glanced at the tomb. Then he uttered a faint cry, for it was as if the sun itself had fallen upon the tomb of death, and it blazed in an awful whiteness. The soldiers and the guards, alarmed at Milo's cry, turned and saw what he was seeing. And they also saw the blinding radiance that shot in rays from the tomb and illuminated the nearby desolation, so that every pebble and every stone was ignited. Those who had remained near the tomb had fallen into a swooning sleep near their fires. Their faces quivered and with scarlet. And there was no sound at all now but the crackling of burning wood and no movement but the rising of thin dark smoke. Breastplate, scabbard, helmet, they reflected the trembling of the fire and did not stir on the ground. The scattered pots glimmered. The men with Milo uttered one fierce yell of terror. Then, as if struck by lightning, they fell one by one on the earth into a profound translite slumber. Milo stood and could not move, and he saw, through streaming eyes dazzled by the blazing of the tomb, that in that light moved tall masculine figures of even brighter light and they were rolling the stone at the entrance as easily as children roll a ball. They saw their giant limbs, their titan faces, beautiful as gods, their bare arms and manly shoulders, their flowing hair, and all about them the radiance palpitated, glowing with what appeared to be multitudes of white fireflies, bright and restless as the stars. Titus Milo Platonius had never known panic or terror in his life before like this. No, not even when he had fought the Germani and the Parthians in his early youth, before he was a Praetorian guard. It seemed to him, as he tried to shield his eyes from the unearthly light, that he possessed no heart any longer, that it had flowed away, leaving only the most frightful fear in its place and that his bowels had melted. The big muscles in his legs and arms shook like a palsy. There was a choking and burning in his throat. 
It was as if he were being consumed by flames. The great figures, several of them, moving the stone, appeared to become aware of him, and they turned their majestic faces to him, and he saw their lamp-bent eyes and their remote expressions, and he knew them for what they were. Though they possessed the bodies and limbs of men and the contour of men's faces, they were not men, and there were about them that aloof splendor and impassive neutrality toward him, which announced their apartness from this flesh, from his flesh. They did not glance at the soldiers and the guards on the grounds, even as they looked at Milo. It was as if Olympian deities regarded him, and with as much uninterest. It was this, more than, more even than their presence, the tremendous light on the tomb, which made Milo's presence and a tre which made Milo's spirit quail and sink, for his humanity was wounded, and he felt reduced to less than a beast. He saw that the stone moving away had begun to reveal the black aperture of the tomb, and the terror he had felt before was as nothing to this. He turned and let himself fall headlong on the ground, and he covered his helmeted head with his arms and waited for death, expecting he knew not what. He closed his eyes for very dread, but the shadow of the light was wavered above his, over his lids, even though he tried to protect them with his arms. He did not know how long of a time passed, but at length, as he lay shivering and quaking, he heard a slow and monumental footstep. It came toward him, and seeming to bend the dry and dusty earth under him, and then it paused beside him. He closed his eyes tighter. He feared to look, for now he remembered from his Jewish teachings that those who look upon things not permitted to men must die. But that which was near him did not go on. As he prayed incoherently in his heart, it remained. So he parted his lashes a little and saw beside him two feet of light, sandaled with gold and sparkling like alabaster, fired from the sun. <coughs> Against all the screaming of his will, his desire to rise and flee, his urge to shout and roll away, he opened his eyes wider, as if forced, and they rose slowly over a robe, brighter than the moon, glowing in every fold, glittering with rushing points of light that flaked and fell and blew away. And they rose to a girdle of gold, and then over a breast throbbing with luc lucency, to a column of pale marble, which was a throat. And then to the face, the powerful, gentle, stern, yet tender countenance, the face of a man such as never been seen before, implicit with grace, puissant and kingly. He, said Tylo, Titus Milo to his cousin Saul, wished me to see him, and I saw, and it was enough to last me to the very end of my life. It is more than enough. Saul's face had dwindled, became absolutely white and strained, and as tight as if it had been dried and parched for days in the sun and had no juices remaining. He said, he tried to smile indulgently. Did you recognize that face? Milo looked at him long and somberly. I did. It was the face of Jesus of Nazareth. I knew him at once. He paused. He had died and he had risen. He had been entombed and angels had rolled away the stone. He had risen from the dead. Saul was silent. I must have fainted, said Milo, for when I awakened, all the soldiers and the guards were still asleep, fallen into a trance like death. And I, I rose and I went away. I went to the temple, and I prayed there all day and told no man. And the tomb? It was empty. The light had receded as the light of the sun falls behind the curve of the world. The 
was nothing but a tomb. I looked within by the first light of the morning. The grave clothes were there, discarded, and their pungent perfume floated in the dense air of the tomb. I thought for a little that I saw the bright outlines of two of those titanic forms, but I remembered their celestial indifference, and so I fled. The tomb was empty. That's the end of chapter 25. Please return with me as we'll continue.